In America, we got Final Fantasy 1, 2, and 3. And the next one we got was Final Fantasy 7. But as I already discussed, these are actually Final Fantasy 4 and 6. We never got the actual NES Final Fantasy 2 and Final Fantasy 3. Then, Final Fantasy 8 came out. Just a few weeks later, we finally got Final Fantasy 5, when it was ported onto the PlayStation 1 inside Final Fantasy Anthology. Are y'all paying attention to this shit? There will be a test at the end. Even though it wasn't officially released in the West until 1999, seven years after the Super Famicom version, Final Fantasy V was already getting a lot of attention here when the emulation scene was blowing up. That's pretty much how it was for me. I first played this thanks to emulation. But this is one of those Final Fantasy games that I actually never finished. And it's been so long that it might as well be an all new game for me. Now, for the sake of this video, I'm going to be using a reproduction cartridge that I got from shopflashbackgames.com. I wanted to try to play it in its original, purest form as much as possible. Unfortunately, that does mean this uses an outdated fan translation, the same one that the emulation scene used in the 90s, and it's filled with a whole lot of mistakes, like uh, Kryl being named Kara, so on and so forth, so just bear with me on that. The very first time you boot up the cartridge, you're greeted with an awesome sight. A full-on intro bringing you into the game. A fancy intro with great music and opening credits. Look, for 1992, this was cinematic AF. You don't even select a file, you go straight into the start of the game. It's minor, but a great way to pull you into the world as soon as possible. Final Fantasy V starts out as stereotypical as it gets. Introduce the main characters, they're all chilling, and then JESUS CHRIST THE GODDAMN METEOR HITS THE PLANET! Alright, they're actually fine. Nearby the crash site is our main hero of the game. Okay, this is one of those translation things that I was talking about. The original fan translation made his name, Butts. His official name these days is Bart, so I'm going to be changing it to that. The main reason being, I don't want this video riddled with a bunch of butt jokes. It's boring, it's unoriginal, a lot of people have done that already, so I don't, I don't want to. Cool? Got it? Alright, just don't be an ass about it. Shit, was that a butt? Damn it! I just said I wasn't- Naturally, Bartz wants to see a meteorite because that sounds tight. So he rides off on his trusty pet chocobo named Boko. We're also introduced to all of our other heroes. Ferris, a pirate leader. Lena, a princess of the Wind Kingdom and wyvern rider. And Galaf, a total dad with amnesia. It doesn't take long for the heroes to come together, with Lena pointing out how the wind has stopped. Therefore, Lena is on her way to the Temple of the Wind Crystal, with Galaf mentioning, while he doesn't remember anything, he knows he has to go there too. Thus, they go to a nearby cave and try to steal a pirate ship, to no avail because there's three of you and there's no win, you stupid idiots, Jesus Christ, what is wrong with you? After recognizing Lena's pendant, Ferris has the exact same one and agrees to take them to the Wind Shrine. Even though there's no wind, Ferris can pilot the ship to the shrine, thanks to the longtime companion, Sildra. Aww, he's cute! And yeah, they make their way to the Shrine of the Wind Crystal. Gee, an epic RPG in which you collect the four treasures of the element. Oh shit! Don't collect them? In an incredible, innovative first for the Final Fantasy series, you don't get the four crystals of the elements. People have been using the different crystals' energy to power their cities and machines and whatnot, overusing them to the point that they shatter. So, while this is another installment about crystals, it isn't about saving them. It's too late. However, before they shatter, the crystals imbue the four heroes with one of the best things to ever grace all of Final Fantasy, jobs. Returning from Final Fantasy 3 is the job system. I can't overstate how much I love this. Any character can be anything. Some of them may be slightly more inclined toward physical or magic classes, but you have free reign on how to make them. So at least one's gonna be a thief, obviously. However, unlike Final Fantasy III, the job system is greatly expanded beyond a single ability. 
Every class now has several passive abilities to go with battle actions. This includes stuff like the thief being able to sprint or see secret passages, or the geomancer being able to avoid pitfalls. Even better, as the jobs level up, you can learn additional actions to use in battle. And on top of that, every job comes with an ability, plus an open slot to assign any other ability. Either one to use while fighting or a passive from another job. I can't even begin to describe how much customization this provides. There's so many options for mixing abilities for incredible power. Like the Rune Knight's ability to cast magic on a weapon, combined with the fighter's ability to wield a weapon with two hands. Or a white mage that can also cast black magic. Or a bard that can get the fuck out of my party. Literally dozens of possibilities. It's fantastic. This allows for you to play how you want. Practically any boss and dungeon, minus an exception or two, can be defeated using any combination of jobs. Not having the rigidness like in Final Fantasy III removes that frustration of feeling punished for not playing how the game wants you to. Instead, it's a feeling of freedom. And this freedom creates one of the most replayable Final Fantasy entries in the franchise. You can also practice the piano! Further expounding on the importance of the job system, leveling up means almost nothing. The only thing that changes at each level up is getting more maximum hit points and magic points. That's it. What makes playing RPGs fun are the constant rewards of leveling up, new equipment, and seeing tangible improvements. But the level ups don't matter anymore. So where's the reward now? It's in the job system. Job level ups are far more exciting than getting experience points. Since there are no stat increases from level ups or job level increases, earning enough ability points and unlocking new job levels earns new abilities and passives for you to use. It's exciting to know that each time a job level increases, you'll get some useful reward. It makes each job level up feel important and worthwhile. There's always a payoff. This is especially true as you start to realize that not all classes level up equally, as some have varied speeds of advancement, making longer ones seem that much more tantalizing to obtain- Whoa, what? Are you serious? Once you hit its max level, you master a job. From there, you can master other jobs, and doing so is worthwhile, because if you change any character back to their base freelancer job, you really get the full customization spectrum. That character takes the highest stat adjustment of all available jobs they've mastered, automatically making them the best they can be. They also have every passive ability of every mastered job, and most importantly, two open ability slots. The possibilities towards the end of the game are staggering. I can't stress this enough. The job system is what makes Final Fantasy V so worth playing. Even in my own playthrough, there were so many options I didn't get to take and explore and so many combinations I wanted to try, and it was so fun. I was very tempted to start a new file just to see how I could play the game differently, something I hadn't felt since Final Fantasy 1. Very few RPGs in general can match this level of customization and that feeling of playing how you want to play. The different jobs, weapons, spells, the mixing of abilities, it's so good. Damn it. For as fantastic as the job system is, some choices were made for the battle system itself that are both good and bad. The active time battle system returns from Final Fantasy IV, only now we have these handy little bars letting you know when a character will be ready next. It helps you plan upcoming actions, and these bars stick around for as long as the ATB system itself does for the rest of the series. However, spells no longer have a casting time. The moment you choose any level of spell, it immediately pops off. This feels less strategic, as there's no downside for choosing your most powerful option. Even the strongest summons happen instantly. It's generous, sure, but like, not as fun? I suppose I value the risk-reward balance too much. Also, the row system returns, making characters in the back deal and receive half physical damage. And in this game, it's the same for the enemies. Monsters behind others also take half damage from physical attacks. This seems like an attempt to add more strategy to fights and make you prioritize enemies in the front lines, but instead it feels more restrictive. Instead of being able to focus on high priority targets, it's better to take them out in order. It promotes that mash A to win mentality that can plague RPGs. 
it's more restrictive than interesting. That isn't to say Final Fantasy V doesn't have interesting battles, because it has some of the coolest boss battles that really utilizes the ATB system and the physical space of the battle screen. Like one versus a sandworm, where right before you target it with an attack, it'll move which hole it's sticking out of, and swinging in an empty one punishes the party with a strong counterattack. Or this void hole thing, where after knocking out at least one party member, it'll start to suck the bodies in to remove them from the battle permanently. It adds a sense of urgency as you try to defeat it before that happens, and you can add some extra time by being in the back row. Also, can I just point out how amazing some of the monster designs are? They've been kind of samey for the first four games, and in here, they're fucking metal! Like this guy, whose tongue is protruding out so hard, he's ripping off his own face, Jesus! This entire dungeon has monsters that look like they were borrowed from Doom. Overall, the combat is good. The sheer number of different options you can do thanks to mixing job abilities helps it a lot, even if it has a few tweaks that I'm not a fan of. The boss battles are interesting enough to make up for it, since a lot of them feel like you really need to strategize to overcome, and it's possible, instead of having to grind levels just for higher hit points. The music in this game has a few standout excellent tracks. Nope, not that. The battle music is pretty good. Not my favorite or amazing, but good. I also like the renditions of the Crystal Prelude and the Final Fantasy Overture. I also like the theme of Final Fantasy V that plays in the great opening sequence, in the credits, and used for the overworld. And the Chocobo theme is one of the best. The victory theme is as classic as ever, but let's be real. The most famous and best track is known to people who haven't even played the game. Battle on the Big Bridge. It's a fantastic music track, sounding very different than anything else in the game, and different than most songs in the whole series. It's so good that it gets reused again and again in future Final Fantasy games as fun throwbacks. This song is probably more well known than the rest of the game itself. It makes sense, truthfully. Certain music is great. The gameplay is very solid and that's what people remember. Since the story isn't good, it's fine and serviceable, but easily the weakest part of the whole game. It isn't bad, but noticeably unimpressive. The main characters aren't all that exciting. Ultimately, every story is about how does a character change from the beginning to the end. And in this case, they're all about the same? The only real major character development is Ferris, when it's revealed that the pirate leader is actually a woman the whole time. This was probably pretty shocking and surprising at the time, but by today's standards, it isn't handled the most eloquently and ultimately changes very little in the story, since it's revealed early on. Vera still ended up being my favorite character because of her general competency and take-no-shit attitude. She seemed like the least one-note of them all. Fascinatingly, the character who got the best character development is an enemy. Gilgamesh starts out as a humorous enemy at the start and goes through a complete change and helps the party by the end. This was new for the series, and old Greg here becomes very endearing. Even as I think about major story beats now, there aren't a whole lot of them. The biggest one would be involving Gallif, and spoiler alert, I guess, if you don't want to hear this, three, two, one, the dude dies. He does go out like a total badass, fighting main villain X-Death beyond his limit and sacrificing himself to save his friends. More importantly, unlike Final Fantasy IV, Gallif actually dies. No off-screen return to life or hand-wavy revival, he's dead. They make this clear with a simple, yet effective, text box. He's gone. Sorry everyone, Final Fantasy VII was not the first one to make a major party death permanent. Uh, sort of. Gallif's death ends up being... inconsequential. As soon as Gallif dies, you meet his granddaughter, Kryl, and she immediately receives all the abilities, job points, and progression that Gallif did. So you don't really end up losing anything major. It also makes the story weaker in my opinion, since Kryl doesn't get developed at all, especially since she appears so late in the story. 
I do like the theming of the plot, though. It's about environmentalism. All those crystals we normally save, they shatter because people harness their energy too much to live comfy lives and ruin everything. And the main villain, Axdeath, is the physical embodiment of an ancient tree who gets pissed! Oh my god? This tree is trying to kill me. Fuck you, nature. He seeks revenge on the world, and by getting the crystal shattered, he's able to access a power known as the Void to truly punish the world. He's nature itself fighting back. One of my favorite moments is when you enter X Death's tower, and after using magic to dissolve the illusion, you see that the entire tower is made of flesh. It's great symbolism. People make all their homes out of trees, so he makes his out of skin. Like I said, fucking metal. That said, the story overall is very humorous. A lot of silly things happen, including a lot of physical comedy that doesn't really land in the limitations of small sprites on the Super Nintendo. The attempts at humor gets tiring pretty quickly, and this becomes more obvious as you hear their one funny song way too many times. Yeah, this one. It gets tiring. An example would be here. After falling into a pit and having rope problems, Kryle gets a splinter. Then a short while later, while meeting with the Great Turtle Sage, the splinter flies out of her finger and then... X-Death! <laughs> I disguised myself as a splinter! <laughs> and then in Dragon Ball Z fights the turtle! <laughs> I will say that this game has one of the better endgame options of the series. There are numerous additional dungeons, which you can use to unlock up to 12 relic weapons, each one used by different classes. There are plenty of extra summons to obtain, extra jobs, and the ultimate white and black magic spells. None of it is necessary, but worthwhile to do, and gets you more of those delicious job points as you do it. These extra things to do easily adds on another 6 to 8 hours of gameplay, which is awesome for an otherwise shorter RPG. I finished the whole thing in about 28 hours after doing everything. I love the imagery of the final boss battle. X-Death is literally a screaming tree. It's visually cool with the tree spiraling up and out of the void. Of course, he has a second form as Neo X-Death, and it, uh, it's got a lot going on here. Like, I think this part is actually him, even though he looks more like the Emperor from Final Fantasy 2. But there's also this toothy goat thing, a demon-faced dude down here, a pissed off unicorn, a couple of demon bros chillin', and just a surprising amount of titties. Look, there's another face! It's impressive looking, but doesn't seem like it thematically fits everything else going on in the game. After defeating Neo X Death, the weakened party readies themselves to leave the void. Wait, what? Not the whole party? Oh no! I got a bad ending! Yeah, it turns out that if any of your party members are knocked out when X Death is killed, they get left behind. This slightly alters the end sequence, providing additional epilogue moments or not. It isn't too big of a change, but forget that noise. I beat X Death again just to make sure I got the best possible ending. It's minor changes, but I like that there are slight alterations depending on how your final battle goes. It's neat, and works itself into the ending organically. I liked it. Final Fantasy V is commonly referred to as the most underrated Final Fantasy game. I disagree. It isn't underrated. Everyone I've spoken to who has played it speaks really highly of it. I'll add my voice to that chorus. The job system is excellent and the whole game is really replayable thanks to it. The story isn't fantastic, but the gameplay is so good on its own, it's worth playing through. It isn't underrated. It is the most overlooked. Not enough people have played Final Fantasy V. Sadly, there aren't enough platforms to play it on. I played the Super Nintendo original, but that isn't the best version to play. Even though it was the first official port that we got, do not play the PS1 port. Load times are bad, and the translation is awful, like making Ferris be a stereotypical YAR pirate throughout. This is the same version that's available for download on PlayStation 3 and PlayStation 4. Avoid it. 
The Game Boy Advance version has the best translation and adds in even more jobs and dungeons. The sound chip doesn't make the music sound as good, but I'm not gonna pretend like emulation doesn't exist. Use a GBA version ROM and look for a sound restoration patch for the best possible experience. And sweet lord, avoid the mobile and Steam ports. Just, ugh. I'm glad I finally got around to finishing it because, man, I just, I love the job system. And this is one of the best implementations of it, if you don't count Final Fantasy Tactics. I can reasonably recommend Final Fantasy V for any Final Fantasy player in general, or anyone who plays RPGs. And I played the piano enough that I finally mastered it. Look! Thank you so much for watching. Truly, I mean that. Be sure to subscribe and like the video. And if you haven't yet, check out my other Final Fantasy videos. And be sure to follow me over on Twitch.